All right. With that, the amazing Sandra Laurent, I'm going to turn it over to you and sit back and learn alongside all of you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome. My name is Sandra Laurent, and I'm the Executive and Artistic Director of Red Sky Performance. Misko Gijuget Kwe, Tamigma Anishinaabe, and Donjaba. One of the things I just said is that I'm from Tomogamy, Northern Ontario, but based uh, in Toronto. So before we begin, I would like to do a very, uh, I'd like to acknowledge our home here in the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Mississaugas of New Credit First Nations. I'd like to recognize the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples and that Tecaronto, where trees are standing in the water, continues to be home to many diverse nations today. Um, you know, when we say uh, Tecaronto, uh, we speak of the place where trees grow in the water. When we say Ontario, you speak of sparkling water. And when we say the name Canada, another Indigenous world, word it is the it is the village our home and wherever where you look there is clean so we here um, in our region we are in with uh, dish with one spoon territory which is a treaty between the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee nations that binds us to protect the land and and the territory so uh, may we all be here in the spirit of peace, uh, friendship, and respect. So I, I say chimigwich, thank you, and merci beaucoup. Mm -hmm. I would like to, um, at this point in time, introduce you to Carly Chase. Uh, she is our guest speaker today, and she is an accomplished um, executive, uh, primarily working in the nonprofit sector. She has extensive experience with charitable Indigenous organizations, and most recently was the executive director of the Legacy of Hope Foundation, a national charity that educates all Canadians about the legacy of residential schools and to promote hope and healing across Canada. She's also a drummer and a singer, um, and she's part of a drum group, um, Women of Obama. And she holds a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from the University of BC and is a certified human rights professional um, and she is coming to us from all the way from BC today. So um, I would like to introduce her. And Mr. Tim, let me just tell you a couple of words uh, about Mr. Tim before we begin. So Mr. Tim is about the taming of a wild horse. It is a, a, um, a story that we created because we realized that there were a lot of stories going out and a lot of things for adults but very little happening for children so we created a story of reconciliation for children mm -hmm. specifically told through the taming of this wild horse called mr tim mm -hmm. and basically it's the story of a girl who lives on a reservation and has a different approach to taming the horse to a boy who lives on the ranch side of the fence they were both taught never to cross that fence ever and this wild horse comes into the world and then they have to cross that divide. They have to cross that fence and learn ab about one another. And that's basically essentially the story um, in a nutshell. So without further ado, um, we can talk more about Mr. Tim at the end, but for now, I would like to introduce Carly Chase. Miigwech. Sam. Wayadka, everyone. Uh, thank you, first of all, Sandra, uh, for that beautiful introduction. I, Sandra and I met years ago when I was the executive director of Legacy of Hope, and just she's one of those people that when you meet immediately, you just she just lights up a room. She sparks such creativity and joy everywhere she goes. She's such a focused human being, and it's so great to be here uh, supporting her newest venture of Mr. Tim. I can't, uh, I'm so excited to see it. I can't, I can't wait to dive into the mystical world that I know you've created. So um, miigwech uh, from your territory and Kukutem uh, from my territory. And thank you to Cobblestone Collective and Michelle for that great introduction and for keeping us all on track today. I really appreciate that. 
And so I will now give uh, my land acknowledgement. Um, I'm actually here. I just love the power of technology. Isn't this great? I'm coming to you from uh, Kelowna, British Columbia. And so I'm right now a guest um, on the Okanagan Territory, uh, which is an entire nation alliance. There's uh, five different nations. And I just hold my hand and say Limlet in their nation's uh, language and Kukshem for allowing me to be a guest in their home. I acknowledge that this land is their land since time immemorial and has not been given up for any treaties or uh, it is their land and they've been creating um, space for their children since time immemorial. And so I was born and raised in Kelowna and I feel like I've been a guest in someone's territory for my entire life. I spent uh, about 13 years in Ontario, Ottawa specifically. So I'm seeing a lot of um, the school boards that I know well <laughs> from my time there. Um, I did work, it was so nice to see Calgary Treaty 7. I did work up in Sitsika First Nation. Um, so I just see the beautiful part about walking this journey on Turtle Island is that we all get to practice being guests. We get to practice what it means to be humble and it doesn't matter if we're indigenous or not we get to practice um, showing gratitude for for the generosity of so many different nations that um, are offering and are being their very gracious host to us and so as i was taught what we acknowledge is that it is their land and i make a commitment to walk gently on this land while i'm here and i will leave it in the condition that i found it and uh, so from there, I'm actually not far from my territory, though. I'm Shaquetmik from the interior of BC. So my um, community is Skeetison, and I saw some Kamloops uh, people that are on. So Wayatka uh, to my, my relations there from Shaquetmik territory. And uh, my entire family went to the Kamloops Residential School. Um, so I'm the first of my family not to attend. And of course, we all know that Kamloops was where the first uh, 215 children's remains were uncovered. And so I just want to raise my hands to that community and to that school for all of the healing that we're still doing and that work we're doing to bring back our children with honor, because uh, that's what it's really about. We're, we're bringing up these stories so that we can honor them in a new way, in a different way. And that's what reconciliation is. So... On that note, what all you beautiful teachers are here to talk about today is this week we've got, which is the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, Orange Shirt Day. And of course, we know that reconciliation is not a day. <laughs> this is a journey that we're doing all together. And I wish to say, Cook uh, Shem, and thank you to all of you for being here and for caring about how our children go through school. You know, this is what residential school brought us into this mess amongst many other colonized issues, but schools were a major caveat for the breakdown of what's happened in our communities. And so what that means is that it can also be the caveat for what brings great healing. And so I say thank you from the bottom of my heart, Kukshem, for choosing to be here in this good way, for choosing to see things differently, for making a concerted effort to start that journey to reconciliation, because that is indeed the first start. So today we're going to talk about um, really three things. I'm going to take you on a little journey here. Uh, the first part of my talk, I'm going to go into our traditional ways of being, what our circle looked like for our children traditionally. So how we would have raised children before colonization. Then I want to briefly touch on how that circle was broken, right? So we're going to just touch on, we're only together for about an hour and a bit, so we're not going to be able to do a super deep dive, but a little bit on residential schools so you can see that in the context of traditional teachings. And then we're going to move on to part three, which will be about how we put that circle back together again, because that's really what reconciliation is. And we'll have some concrete steps for you guys of what you can do in the classroom, but even more importantly, what you're going to do for yourselves in this reconciliation journey. So let's get started. I will share my screen. Okay, is everyone seeing the screen here? I'm just trying to get it to present. It's taking its sweet time. There we go. All right, so to get started, I, I have to say this is something that I've been doing for a while because I get asked it 
all the time, no matter what presentation or where I do it, uh, particularly when we deal with teachers, is that I get asked, what do we call you? What, what's the right thing to do? And so just on a very high level, um, I'll just speak to Aboriginal or Indigenous. And we've seen this movement towards the concept of Indigenous in past years. And the first thing to know about the term Indigenous is that it is, there's not really one accepted definition of Indigenous communities worldwide, but there are characteristics that Indigenous communities share around the world. And I've listed them here for you. Um, first one being that they're smaller populations, you know, relative to the, re the rest of the country. Definitely they have their own language. And I mean, here in Canada, we have the most diverse language groups of any place in the world. So the different language families of the different First Nations that you meet in the Métis uh, are all there. We have our own distinct languages. We have very distinct cultural traditions. And probably the most important that you hear most often through these land acknowledgements is we have our own land and territory. And we are connected to that land and, uh, land and territory in unique ways, in powerful ways, in ways that shape our very being. So more than just saying we were born somewhere, our very um, DNA and how we move in the world is connected to the land and to our land and territory. And finally, we self-identify as that. <laughs> so it's not a government institution. It is not an academic institution um, that actually defines whether we are Indigenous or not. We, as Indigenous people, self-identify. Um, so why we, there was a movement from Indigenous among many regions, uh, reasons for Aboriginal is that um, the little prefix there of ab, I'm sure many of you have heard this. So in looking at the word Aboriginal, when you put ab in front of it, it's like we're not original. And yet the Indigenous peoples, that's exactly what they are. And so the, the key thing to remember, though, is that the term Aboriginal is still within Canada's constitution, and it includes three group, groups of Indigenous people. And, there, and those are the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. And so one of the things I, I get a lot is people will often interchange the word Aboriginal with First Nations. And it's really important to know that that's not correct. When you say Aboriginal, you're actually meaning all three groups, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. So in the same way, you wouldn't say people and women. <laughs> you don't say Aboriginal um, and Inuit and Métis, right? When you say Aboriginal, it's all three groups. Having said that, the easiest thing seems to be there is great consensus across Turtle Island around the word Indigenous because it honors our language, our cultures, how we're tied to the land, and how we self-identify. So on that note, let's talk about our circle and these cultural foundations for supporting children. In getting started, what we can know, and I'm, I'm hoping we can all be there, is that to know that there was a time where we were raising children, Indigenous people were raising children to be strong, to be self-reliant, <laughs> to be literate, to be educated, um, to be uh, self-respecting and also respecting of others. So we had processes for raising children that are still valid today. And in order to begin this journey of reconciliation, you know, our elders always say that we want to look back at those waters. You know, when you stand in a river, uh, you stand and we, we are paying attention to the water hitting our, our, our feet at the beginning. But we have to look at the water that came before us right? It still impacts us. And then the water that's going to be leaving us after it touches our, our legs. So it's that the generations that came before us right now and the generations moving forward. And so um, we always want to honor our elders' teachings and start with some cultural teachings. The medicine wheel. I feel like so many of us have heard these beautiful teachings again. And so I'm just going to start very briefly by saying why we use the medicine wheel is to simply speak about how we want to live our best lives. I think out in um, Ontario way, you have a word in the Ojibwe language called minobamadzawin, which is you know easily translated to health. There's no exact word for health, but it's living the good life. That's what minobamadzawin means, is the good life. 
And so our elders tell us that when we live the good life, we have all of these aspects of our being in complete balance that we are looking to have the spiritual, the emotional, the mental, and the physical aspects of ourselves in complete balance. And um, so when, when I travel, I'll often hear often that this is a First Nations teaching, um, which is very true. The medicine wheel itself comes from First Nations. And a tricky part for teachers is that you always want to be able to say, okay, this is the colors, here's the four colors, here's the directions that they're in, here's the language that they're meant to be in. But as all of our teachings are, they go along with specific nations that they come from. And so different nations have different colors, they have different um, directions that each of these parts of your um, well-being are in. Uh, some of them don't necessarily even have the medicine wheel. And so it's important to know, I had an elder when I raised this to her and I said, what, well, what do I do? I'm traveling around the country and how do I honor the different teachings? And she said, the important thing is, is to pick one and stick to it <laughs> for whatever makes sense for you. And so that doesn't mean that you're rigid to others. It means that how you communicate it. So how I'm communicating this to you today is how I've been taught it. And it doesn't mean the other ones are wrong. It simply means that this is the ones that, that I know of. And so I will draw your attention. You know, when I speak to educators like all you are, I think of our schools. And the thing about school is that we value, or I should say education, is that we value really one half of the medicine wheel. We value the mental so what we learn, and we value the physical and spiritual aspects of children and emotional aspects of children, besides of the preschool and kindergarten years, slowly start to decrease of how we include that in our education way of being. And so it really, you know, our systems are set up to already be in balance. What the beautiful part is for you teachers, though, is that you have the ability to bring in that spirit and emotion, right? Our elders say that that X in the middle of the medicine wheel, it might, we might think that that's what divides those four aspects of ourselves into four quadrants, but actually is what connects us. So those lines are connecting all of those aspects of ourselves to one another. So... I've talked about that this is First Nations. When I talked to an, an Inuit uh, elder, and he said to me, he says, it's true, we don't have the medicine wheel, but what we do have is this concept of well-being, this holistic well-being, and the Métis are the same way. So the medicine wheel is simply um, a symbol, like we use the heart to symbolize love or the heart to symbolize your actual heart beating. It isn't your actual heart beating, <laughs> but it's a way that we can figure that out in our minds. And so that's what the medicine wheel is. But the, the root of the medicine wheel is actually the circle. And so you see that there in purple. And the circle teaches us three things. The first one is, is that we're all connected. When we stand in circle, uh, when I'm with kids, well, I'll actually put um, a string around them. Some of you educators probably have done this already. They'll all hold the string and you ask them to lean back, right? And really pull it taut. And then you can ask someone and you can sit there and you can twang on that string, right? Twang, twang, twang. <laughs> and you'll ask them, who feels that? Who feels that twang? And they can feel that reverberating across that string. If someone drops the string, you feel that. If someone really moves it up and down, you understand that when you're in circle, that you're all connected. The other thing that happens in circle is that we're all equal. There's no such thing as a hierarchy within the circle. Um, when you stand in circle, or I'll just say is that you can only see one another's beauty only see each other's beauty and I was thinking of Mr. Tim and Sandra and talking about how these two boys were divided by a fence and they weren't allowed to connect with one another 
And just that alone is a difference by how our communities were raised, that fence or no fence, we're all connected. And there isn't one side of the fence that's equal or somewhere or, or less equal. We all come with added value, with, with the value that we come, we all have that value. But within that, we're all different, right? In our mainstream world now, we call this a difference between equality and equity, right? So honoring the uniqueness of one another. Um, my favorite teachings of the circle, when, when you sit with an elder, they'll often say, this is the circle that has no beginning and to no end and to which we all belong. And we say that when we stand in circle, we can only see one another's beauty. And my favorite teaching of it is that there's always room for one more in the circle. All we have to do to make room is step back a little bit and our circle can get larger and larger and larger. So we've talked about the medicine wheel. We've talked about the circle. Now I'm going to introduce you to, and some of you, I'm hoping you've heard of this brilliant man named Dr. Martin Brokenleg, who created something called the Circle of Courage. You can see his books here, and there will be resources, links that are given to you at the end of this presentation. The links to his books will be in there as well. Uh, but Dr. Martin Brokenleg, uh, for those of you who aren't aware, is an Indigenous um, child therapist who did all of his work in territories down south in working with Indigenous youth. And he said similar things to what I said earlier, which is, look, I know traditionally, we knew traditionally that we were raising children that were strong and resilient and proud Indigenous adults. So what was it that we did to do that? How We know that right now there's suicide, that kids were dropping out of school, mental health issues, poverty issues. We, we, we saw all those things happening in our communities, but it wasn't always that way. So what do we do? How do we go back to those traditional ways of being? And he based his circle of courage on traditional teachings. And so basically his circle of courage took the circle of the we are all connected, we're all equal, and we're all different. <laughs> he added the medicine wheel, right, which is part of it, that emotional, mental, physical, spiritual well-being. And he added then what I call his deeper dive teachings. He went a little bit deeper. And so let's explore that here. He added something in the East that we call belonging. And we're going to go through each one, but I'll just give you the overview right now. Under uh, the mental quadrant, he called that mastery. Mastery. And then he moved the physical world to independence. And finally, he moved to generosity. And he said those were the four values, the four traits, the four goals, <laughs> the visions that we created for our youth. Those were the things that we ensured that were in each one of our youth for them to be strong and independent adults. So let's go through each one. The first is belonging. And this is, for those of us that have read research, we know that when newborn babies are put into places where they're not snuggled, when they're not held and really taken good care of this way, you can feed them. You can give them water to drink, milk to drink, all of those physical things that should allow their body to grow. If you do not provide them human connection, they do not thrive. And in often cases can die. They, their sickness, their illness grows. And so for Indigenous communities, we know, we call it here, this quote is that you have to be related somehow to everyone you know. There has to be that circle teaching of, I am connected. I am part of a circle. Because this is what allows a child to know deep in their spirit that they are loved. The next quadrant is mastery. And I love this quadrant when we're talking about children because when we get them young enough, there's a natural thirst that children have for learning. We don't have to beat them over their head. There's a time when they're those, that beautiful age that they just, they're just aching to learn things. They want to read, show me, they want to do it with you, right? I want to help. So that we're, we're 
building on something that is naturally ingrained in children. And so when we build on that, the child is able to say, I can succeed. Moving on to independence. This is all about free will. And when you think of independence, it's very interesting when I do this teaching for adults, when I'm looking at how to support adults in their well being, we actually change this word from independence to interdependence. Once more, just um, making that connection between each other and knowing that we need relationships to be interdependent, not codependent, but interdependent. But for children, what they're learning is how to individuate, how we give them the ability to try different things on their own and have responsibility. Such a key word uh, in our communities. Just take a quick second um, to make the relationship between the past quadrant, which was mastery, and this one. I was sitting with an elder and uh, we were having a good chat over tea and she said to me, she said, you know, um, wasn't, you know, it's only been in the last little while that we've been allowed to fail. We can't fail. We never were allowed to fail traditionally. And I looked at her and I, I, I kind of did a head take. I'm, I'm so used to elders are usually so gentle in my opinion and so willing. I certainly have made my fair share of mistakes and failed in my lifetime. And elders are always so compassionate and empathetic towards me. But she was very clear that we were not allowed to fail. And so I sat a little longer for her to expand if she was going to, and, and she did. And she said, when you think back to how we used to learn with mastery, mastery wasn't a sitting and here's the book and read it theoretically and then take a test. Mastery was done through, first of all, seeing what children's natural gifts were. So our grandmothers would be the ones who would be watching the children from a very young age and seeing with them, oh, you're the fast runner. I need to pair you with the hunters because you're going to be going out. Oh, look at you. Look at that one loves to sing. We're going to pair that one with the drummers because they're the ones that are going to have to know our seed songs for planting. They're going to have to know birthing songs. Oh, look at that one and how they caretake little dolls or wanting to caretake the little babies. They're the mothering ones. Perhaps they'll be with the midwives. So it was the grandmothers that would see the talent in the children and call it forth, number one. Number two was to connect them to people who would then mentor them long term so that they would be learning in a new way how to do things. And so the connection, when you're learning that mastery, uh, the example she gave was of hunting. She said, if you were placed with a hunter and you continually came back without any food to feed any meat for the family, your whole community would perish. The survival of the community relied on how well you mastered a skill. So failure wasn't an option that by the time children came up to being an adult, they had to have mastered to perfection what their gifts were and how they were going to give that back to the community. And so this next quadrant of independence, or for adults, when you say interdependence, for children first, in order for them to have confidence, <laughs> they have to learn to do it on their own. So one of the things in the coming of age ceremonies that would happen is that the youth would go off on their own. They would go off into the bush on their own for days to get, whether it's a vision quest, different communities have different teachings around this. But regardless of where you're from, there was always, um, feels like a disconnection, but a, a removal of that, of that child, of that youth on their own. So they would learn to make their own decisions. As an adult, once you've done that and you know you have that power to make decisions, why it moves to interdependence is that once you've mastered your gifts, once you have those skills, if you don't give them back to the community, if you don't make a connection back to the community to share those skills, 
you also haven't ensured the survival of your communities. And so that part is so important. This, this, you start to see, remember I said that X, how it doesn't divide, it connects. Each one of these quadrants links into the other one, traditionally, of how we raise children. Uh, final quadrant here is that this is about generosity. This is about knowing when we give, <laughs> that's how we know we have purpose in our life. Not when we get. So what's interesting is that in mastery, where we are receiving information, we're receiving skills from someone who knows more than us, that's not where we get our purpose. Our purpose actually comes when we are giving. Um, another beautiful elder, a Cree elder up from uh, Edmonton Way said, said to me that she, uh, she talks about a gift economy. And she says that we absolutely had economies as an Indigenous people traditionally, but we had gift economies. And she said a gift economy has three parts to it. The first part being is the giveaway. Many of us have heard about a giveaway, I'm sure. This is where, especially the more power you get, the more that you give away. But you go to a typical giveaway and people, you give away your possessions so that you don't have a connection to physical things. You are gifting to the community so that it shares the wealth. But she says, we often forget the, about the other two parts of a gift economy. The second one is the takeaway. So it moves from the person who's done the gifting to then the responsibility of the person who is taking away that gift. What is that responsibility? What I take away? When I have taken something away, do I just then throw that gift away? No, I'm going to take it away to use not only for my benefit, but for my families and possibly my community as well. The third component of a gift economy is then the re-gift. And I know we all roll our eyes at the re -gift. Oh, dear, dear, we can't do a re-gift. But in traditional communities, that's how we kept it going. We weren't consumer, we were not a consumer society. We were the original recyclers and keeping that circle going of an economy. So we would give away, we would take away, and we would re-gift. So it became a closed circle. And that's how wealth could grow with everyone being part of it. And it was in this growing wealth of a circle that our youth would know I have a purpose for my life. I see where I give away, I see where I take away, and I see where I can re-gift. Moving on to how then, I always feel I have to take a big breath. Taking a big breath after there, I find those teachings so beautiful and they always speak to my heart uh, in such real ways. But we know as beautiful as these teachings are, they aren't how we're continuing on right now. They're not our reality. And so this circle was broken, as we all know, through colonization. So let's look at some of these pieces. I think I should put in front of historical facts the not so historical facts. Um, because as we know, the Indian Act is still alive and well in Canada and Turtle Island, and it's still the only piece of legislation in the world around a race of people. And so even though it came about in 1876, um, this Indian Act is still here with us. It's gone through revisions, but it's still here. And where it started was to say, first of all, that every Indigenous person in Canada became a ward of the state. And so as educators, you know that as soon as you hear ward of the state, that means that even as grown adults, we were seen at best as children, but at worst, something simply to own or to throw away. So that was the very basis of the Indian Act. If you don't remember anything else, know that that is the root, that people became wards of the state. Through this act, we couldn't vote. So Indigenous women got the vote in 1960. So that means um, immigrants from all over the world could come to Canada and have the right to vote before the actual original peoples of this land could. A dear friend of mine um, who is Inuk and Italian uh, speaks to that all the time, that um, her husband, who was Italian, 
his parents could come at the exact same time and vote immediately, whereas her parents, who were both Inuk, um, could not vote. So how does that change the landscape of Canada when the original peoples of this land are not able to vote and lend our voice? We couldn't own property. All of our land rights were taken away. We could not conduct business. So this is, and I will link it to the next bullet there. We're talking about selling crops or killing livestock. Um, back then at that time, that was often how you conducted business was through selling crops. I think of my grandmother of picking berries and learning how to make money um, through doing that. And we weren't allowed to do that. You, it was specifically stated in there that you could not um, make more money than to serve your own family. Uh, for the crops, it was in there, you could have one rake, one hoe, um, you could only have, you know, one cow. All of these things were so regimented for our communities. And then we couldn't conduct our sacred ceremonies and customs. And, you know, it's when you think about this first, you know, half hour presentation that we've gone through here, all of these things that were said from the land acknowledgement to these circle teachings to the medicine wheel teachings, all of that would not be allowed. And I know I skipped a bullet <laughs> and that one is about traveling freely. And I, I leave that till now because it, it talks, that's really where the reservation system came from and the past system. So every single First Nation reservation had an Indian agent attached to it where we had to get passes in order to freely travel between communities. And, you know, if you can imagine, I started this talk by acknowledging the Okanagan Nation and all of the different, the five nations that make up the alliance here in this territory. In order to, they before the Indian Act, would just freely travel <laughs> between these communities. They would intermarry and they would have celebrations. And all of that was stopped. They had to ask permission and get passes. And I think of how hard that was during COVID this year of us not being able to travel freely. And our people have had those restrictions on us for you know, hundreds of years. And what's interesting is I remember um, getting a group of, of South Africans that came up to a place I was working at for a while. And they told us that in school, what they learned was that the apartheid was partly gifted to them by Canada. And what they said is that all of them studied the, what South African government did is they came up and studied this Indian Act, specifically the past system around that traveling freely before introducing apartheid. So that's the gift that Canada had on South Africa. I'm sure by now many of us have seen this picture of Thomas More of the before and after. And um, if I could wave my magic wand and have one wish, I think it would be to stop calling residential schools schools uh, because they weren't that. They were institutions of genocide to make sure that Indians were not around and that killing the Indian and the child was in government documents. So I didn't make up that, te that text. Um, if you go back and look at government documents, those were the, was the language of the day. And so it's important to note it, that these schools existed until 1996. That was the year that I graduated. Um, over a third of our children attended. Again, that is a best guess for us because records weren't kept. Um, we, were, we don't know, it could be much more. And two stats that I always like to bring up is 40, in 1907, there was a report that 42% of some children in some of the residential schools were dying before the age of 16. So that was reported and known and nothing was done. And so when they looked at it again in 1947, not for all schools, but for some of them, this had increased up to almost 40, uh, 50%. So knowing, <laughs> hence why I wouldn't like to call them to call schools. It isn't a school when 50% of children are dying. It isn't school where children leave and still are illiterate. It isn't school when children are abused on every aspect of that medicine wheel, mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And so that's what we are dealing with. And um, this is some pictures of my family. 
Um, this is a picture of my grandmother holding my mother. Uh, it's my mother's tie. That's an actual picture of her on the Data Residential School. Um, my grandmother went home to the community and because uh, my grandmother had been working outside to have money. So my mother was being raised by her granny up until then. And so my grandmother came and uh, got my mother and my mother had long hair down um, past her bum at that time. And my grandmother didn't want her to go through the trauma of having her hair cut. So she came and she cut it first. And um, she took my mother, so instead of all the kids would be rounded up in trucks and taken to the residential school. Um, and instead my grandmother went and took my mother there. And my grandmother actually got a job at the residential school um, to be closer to my mother um, at the time. And this is um, the picture of the kids on the other side is of uh, my mother is the one, you know, it's hard to see, but at the very bottom in the middle, of her sticking out her tongue. Um, and this is Countless Residential School. And the girl to her left um, passed away shortly after this picture was taken along with her brother, but we don't know why or how they passed away. And so I just feel again, the need to acknowledge the 215. So this school where this my mother went and my grandmother and my great grandmother all went was the Countless Residential School. And so all of the children knew about that graveyard they saw children being taken there and I just acknowledge the grief that's happening in Kempoops right now and uh, the healing that is needing to happen for our communities and the honoring of the children that went there so if we go back to the circle teachings um, I'd like you to just stretch your minds a little bit to see that actually colonization in and of itself is a circle and the difference here is that it's not a circle of courage, it's a circle of colonization. And the first things that happens is that if we take this wheel and we put killing the Indian and the child in the middle, we get very different outcomes. So if we once again start with belonging, we certainly know that residential schools didn't have belonging. It was a loss of a place of that. Um, kin were separated, so when we talked about be related to as many people as you know, residential schools were all about being related to as few people as you know. Siblings were taken apart, cousins were taken apart, boys, boy, boys and girls were separated. So there was that connection was severed. Not only with the belonging, you had physical punishment, physical and sexual abuse of children. So in, if you remember, instead of feeling loved, remember that one was saying, I feel loved, they knew that they just had trauma on every single piece. They were not enough. For mastery, it wasn't about mastery. It wasn't about them using their gifts. This was number one child labor. Um, my great grandmother went to the school first and she came, still came back illiterate. They, these schools were not set up to have our children become doctors or lawyers or nurses or teachers or anything. They were at best to become slaves for the white population. They were there to learn how to clean, to cook, to raise food for um, non-Indigenous Canadians. Under this mastery, they had new rules of behavior and language. I mean, mastery, our very language says how we see the world. And all of that was going to be brand new for our children. And as I just said, I use the word education loosely there because it certainly wasn't scholastic. And if we take out independence from the West, um, this is not about freedom. This is where all actions were controlled. There was zero free will of the children. Every movement they made in the day was completely controlled. And, you know, we, we still have, there's still remnants of that. I mean, in our schools, we still have bells that tell the time and there's, everything is so regimented for our children. And where do they have places to have that free will to just to run to be to make decisions on their own but in residential schools it's also these unsafe connections and so because those are unsafe there's value in being invisible and that one speaks to me so much because i remember um starting in ottawa you know years ago and we'd have people say i don't i don't think we've got any indigenous people here well i wouldn't say indigenous back then they said i don't think we've got any native people here because it's that hidden in plain sight like that choosing not to see. And so even for our own people, this, this benefit of staying invisible. And I 
know, encourage you to even think of some of your indigenous students that still do that, that we will hide in the back. They're not trying to be front and center. Those are still carried on through our generations. And if we don't have generosity, what do we have? Um, here, this is, there's zero place for gifting. And if any gifts were given, um, many children talk about how they were given gifts by the nuns or the priests as manipulation. So if they would tell on other students or maybe to keep their mouth shut after an abusive situation. So moving from where our gifting is where our, our kids knew what they were here to do, right? Where they knew they had a place in the world. That change to being manipulated, that they didn't want gifts, that gifts were a bad thing. So all of this is the impact in our communities of residential school. And the brilliance of residential school is that it wasn't just one generation. So we weren't like our, our trauma was generation after generation after generation. And so this circle of colonization, all of these lessons that you see in each one of these quadrants are built on and built on and built on generation after generation. But here's the thing, we get to stop it. We, just because it's been built on, doesn't mean we have to be the other ones to build again. We can begin this work of bringing back this circle. And that is what we're really here to talk about today and to think about this week as educators. When we had the TRC, I just loved this quote from uh, the Chief Commissioner, Mary Sinclair, and he said, we have described for you a mountain. We have shown you the path to the top. We call upon you to do the climbing. And so when you think about truth and reconciliation in your role as educators, what I would ask you to look at is what, are, what kind of climbing are you doing? How do you begin that ascent? to recreating this wheel so that a culture of reconciliation is at the center of this wheel again, where we are creating a place of belonging. We're creating students that have mastery, that have mastered their skills, where we have students who know they are independent, they have free will, they can make powerful choices, and students that are part of generosity, that they understand how to gift, that they feel excited to gift and re-gift. And how, so how do we begin that climbing in the classroom? The first thing I will say to each and every one of you is that reconciliation is not about students first, it's about you. You cannot do this work without looking at your own lens. How do you see the world? What are the biases? And we all have them, no matter what our background is. How do we see the world? How do we see our students? So all of these um, lists will be part of the links that are sent out to you after this presentation. But I'm going to simply state here that I call them these reconciliation reading lists. If you just Google that, <laughs> a ton of them come out. And they are all great books. And so this isn't about prescribing, start with this book and then this you're creating your own curriculum. And the important thing to note is, what book do I want to start with? What, what book draws me? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Don't judge it. But what makes me interested in something or not interested in something? But you, we have to start our re-education around Indigenous people in this country. Next, it's a continuation of Know Your Lens. And this one came from our my elders, is that elders always say, you got to show up. you got to show up. And so we cannot forget that participating community as teachers, and I know that can be tough because we ask so much of you in the classroom, but you got to be out there in the community. And so as we move out of the pandemic, thinking of places you can show up <laughs> doing that show that's part of this climbing 
whether it's going to powwows, whether it's attending indigenous community organizations, right? These are often have things that are open to everybody. There are indigenous symposiums, galas and fundraisers are a huge one to be a part of, to start supporting indigenous communities. But find ways you have families, take them to go see things here in um, the territory that I'm in. The West Bank First Nation has a museum right on site that people can go and visit. And so I'm sure right across Turtle Island, different communities have museums that anyone can go and visit at any time. So I encourage you to do that. And so that's the first. Um, I'm going to, in wrapping up the session, I'm going to now focus just on the two first quadrants. And there's reconciliation things that you can do in every quadrant, no doubt. But we're all just getting started. And so I'm a huge component. I really... I really like to support people just starting with a few steps. We don't have to do it all this week. We don't have to do it all this year. <laughs> we are just beginning this journey on reconciliation. And the importance is to be mindful of what it is that we're doing. So here you have up of, of what we're supposed to be doing around belonging. And so I have some reconciliation reflections for you. And what you see is that the first bullet on all of these, I will always start with you. Remember your own lens. So under belonging, I really encourage you to think about what makes you feel loved? How have others shown you love? How do you know where you belong? Understanding that in yourself, possibly you have your own trauma of being disconnected and you're bringing that to the classroom. But starting reconciliation means that you have to have done that work so that Indigenous students can have a space in your classroom. After you've done that, you can move on to the students. And, and when it comes to belonging, I always think that we can really take a look at the space here. That we can take a look at my, how I look at things. So I, um, my mother was an educator her whole life and she always insisted that all her desks be in a circle so that she could have the students looking at each other's beauty all the time. Now that for some of you, your classrooms aren't big enough can be a bit of a challenge, but if we push them right to the edge, it really gives a different feeling than desks in a, in a line or even desks in little pods, right? So you can consider that or even just some part of the day that they're in circle. Um, having indigenous artwork, <laughs> having indigenous books, um, all the, I would say the question is, how do you engage the five senses and find ways to do that for Indigenous kids? I had um, a student once say to me, well, well or a teacher say, well, what does it matter? Just because I put some artwork on the walls, you think it's making a difference for Indigenous kids? <laughs> no, I do not. I do not think we're changing all of the ills of colonization by simply putting some Indigenous artwork on the walls. But it is a first step. We have to start somewhere. The problem I see only is when we see the first step as our last step. So if 10 years down the road, all you've done in your classroom is put an Indigenous poster on the wall, no, you're doing more harm than good. You are constantly meant to grow in this journey of reconciliation. Ask yourself to stretch in different ways to create that place of belonging. And then you see this last little bullet of land. I've put this land on every single one of the, the next slides is to think it's tricky in a classroom and I get it, you're inside. But if you remember the definition or the characteristics of indigenous people, the number one characteristic for us is that we are tied to a land and a territory. It's a very much a part of who we are. And so you as an educator looking for ways to connect your students to the land. So whether that's in bringing in plants into the classroom or rocks, thinking about how you communicate about rocks, or do you still talk to, about them as inanimate or animate objects? Um, do you take your students outside to breathe fresh air? But really stretch yourself to see land as how you're creating belonging in your classroom. It's a different thing. So it's not just a checkbox topic. It's actually a conduit for creating a place of belonging for kids. And I've given you some resources to help with belonging. I feel like a broken record here. Again, it'll all be part on the, um, the links that we give you after this group. 
But there was um, a, a report done by the Wabano Center in Ottawa called Pinatota, and it based, it took a look at five different school boards and school districts across Canada and of success stories of how they improved in uh, the outcomes of Indigenous students and making sure the graduation rates were going up. And it uh, so it takes a look at all the things that they did and it gave recommendations for how to do that. And um, while I'm not a huge fan of checklists, sometimes it's a nice place to start. Some of you don't even know what to be looking at. So this is just a snapshot of uh, the checklist that's in this report. It has all these, I just put up human resources as an example, but they have all these different areas within the school of questions you can ask yourself to see if your school is doing to create that place of belonging for, for students. Um, Toronto Zoo has great guides here. One of them is curriculum-based activity guides. They work with Indigenous um, knowledge keepers and they have all these great activities and stories. Uh, these, and you can download it right for free from the internet uh, to utilize. It's really great. And finally, this came out of the uh, Champlain Lynn Local Health Integration Network in Ottawa. And this was taking a look at mental wellness in youth. So even though this isn't about education, what I loved about this report is that it interviewed youth and what they ne said they needed to have um, live that minimum odds of women. We talked about that, that medicine wheel. And so they gave really concrete recommendations for the things that they're looking for uh, to have that good mental wellness. So that free download is on wabano.com as well. And we're wrapping up here with mastery. We talked about this and we're talking about reconciliation. Once again, we're starting with you guys. And I ask you the, how you're stretching yourself to learn about colonization. As educators, I know you're tired at the end of the day, but education is your jam. So you're looking about how you're stretching yourself to be a learner. Who, who's helping you be a master? of the skills and the gifts that you bring. Maybe connecting yourself to a mentor, but you need to start with yourself first so that you feel you can succeed. Then we move to students and looking at different materials that you can introduce into your classroom about Indigenous people. Um, here I would really encourage you to use Indigenous uh, experts, so whether it's elders, traditional knowledge keepers, Oh man, kids love it when you bring in drummers or dancers right into the classroom, but find ways. This is all about you making these connections in the community to have people come right into your classroom and uh, wow the kids with Indigenous culture. And which links to the other uh, bullet there around others. I just, I love mastery when we think about it from Indigenous lens because it always means that we're engaging others. That's what it always means in the end. And as I mentioned before, the land, um, I'm not giving you any suggestions here. I, I leave it simply as a word for you to once again, think about the land and how that indigenous students see that as defining who they are. And so in knowing that, how do you bring the land into your classroom to help your students with mastery? And so here's some resources for you. Uh, CBC has some teaching guides, which is really great. Uh, they're nice and easy to walk through. The Canadiana Encyclopedia, I really found this one interesting. They have a little topic on Indigenous peoples and specifically they have a timeline. So it's really interesting. You can pick different things, particularly around voting and they, they walk you through the entire timeline of how voting rights came back. So, you know, for your own learning, sometimes it's nice, you don't have hours. You just wanna click and find some, you know, new facts to help your learning. I find this Canadian Encyclopedia is, is a really nice one if you just want some, some quick learning for yourself, it's great. And last but certainly not least, you now have Mr. Tim. And what's so brilliant about what Sandra does is that she's bringing in this art piece. They're bringing in this creative piece so that it, it uses a different part of our mind. When I was looking at all these resources uh, for you guys, I did notice how so much of it was books, like just read this book and this book and this book. And Sandra's taking that and getting out of thinking outside the book and doing things that um, serve us in a new way that get our brains using the different parts of ourselves. And so this is where I leave it. I know we have time for some question and answer, but I leave it to you to know that this is now your turn. How will you begin this climb? 
And thank you, Wyatka, for knowing that you're going to begin this climb using your gift to the best of your ability. So I raise my hands to each one of you. Kukshap miigwech. Wow. Carly, I, I, I know that we're over time, and um, but we've got friends friends in this call that I didn't know were in this call that are messaging me on the side saying, wow, I could listen to Carly all night. Um, really, truly fabulous words and just so incredibly engaging. And um, Sandra, I hope, I hope you'll be able to come out um, and answer some questions as well. Those of you, I know we are over time. Um, Carly, are you able to stay a little longer? Yes, and I'm so sorry. I thought we were here till 4.30. I thought I was on perfect time. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> so I'm so sorry, everybody. Don't, oh, my goodness. Like <laughs> I, I know, said, no I, think we'll stay, I think we'll stay here. Uh, yes, it's long. Um, but really, just so much love. A few people had to leave, um, but just really wanted to thank you for, for all of this. There was a question, and thank you, Shelby. I see your hand up. We'll get to your question for sure, and then Diana as well. Um, but one of the questions, and I'm also wondering, You've got so much great information in that PowerPoint deck. Is that a resource that we can pass on to participants or is that something you maybe hold dear and we'll watch the recording and take screenshots like I was doing the whole time? <laughs> um, just wanted to know your thoughts on that. Uh, happy to share. I don't know how helpful it is. Just a bunch of uh, screenshots, but sure. Oh my goodness. It's yeah. truly helpful. There's so much in there. And so yay for all of those asking. We're going we're gonna to get that. PowerPoint from Carly, and we're going to send that along in a follow-up email. All of those resources Guillaume was posting in here. Thank you, Guillaume, for posting those. We'll send those your way as well. And with that, Shelby, why don't you come out and uh, ask your question? Okay, so I'm actually a library tech for a virtual school, and what I did last week was read one of my most favorite book, children's book, written by an Indigenous author, David A. Robertson, called When We Were Alone. Mm -hmm. Do you think reading books by Indigenous authors could be a way to pave children connection to the past and helping them educate? Absa freaking lootly <laughs> we absolutely have to start with reading it is one beautiful avenue it's to bringing our kids to for them to know that they are seen right we still uh we we have a system that where we need to be literate we need to learn to read and that's an important part all of us i, I read to my nephew i re reading is so important but whose voice are those books is equally as important and so when you get indigenous authors in there whole new perspective kids can have something that they feel like oh wow it was an indigenous author i could be me they could see a, a job that they never saw before but much like i said with the posters i would just say that it's also not the only part of reconciliation no if all we do is books then it's not enough but it oh no i also piece. post information actually on my website and stuff for students to read upon so that's awesome so thank fabulous. you for doing that work that's so great I'm yeah so glad that you're doing that yes and thank you for that question shelby fabulous and we've got diane is next before we jump into diane um we also have people asking about uh mr tim and the study guide and how do we get our hands on that and so um I'm not sure, Sandra, are you here or, or Carly, do you know about the Mr. Tim study guide and how we might get our hands on that? That would be Sandra. I'll leave that to her. Perfect. We'll hold tight. And when we get Sandra back in here, we'll ask her that. But Diane, go ahead. Thank you very much for hosting this event. And Carly, thank you very much for your insights. I wanted to ask a question about land acknowledgement. And um, the present new land acknowledgement that was changed. Um, I'm in Tree 13 and um, I live in Toronto and work in the York Board of Education. And so I was wondering if you could provide any insights into the, the change. And I'm about to approach an exercise from, um, I believe it's the Ministry of Making Land Acknowledgement <laughs> in your classroom with the students. Um, I, I think it was designed for elementary kids and I teach grade 11. I've introduced all of, I'm changing all of the courses 
to the indigenous studies courses where they make an imprint of their foot and they talk about their thankfulness to the land and they have an option of writing either a letter to a, to the land or doing a land acknowledgement. From what I understand is there are some, some etiquette around doing that. It's very important to Indigenous people and I worry about sort of you know, just the appropriation of someone else's land acknowledgement. Um, uh, and, uh, and also how to incorporate them acknowledging their, not only of course their birth, but their own cultural background. Um, so I know my question is very, very general, not very specific, but if you could speak a little bit about land acknowledgement, I'd really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, I think I heard that part. So you told me to speak about land acknowledgements and just my thoughts on it. And I, you were kind of cutting out there at the beginning. It sounds like there was a land acknowledgement made by your school board and then it got changed. Is that right? And you're wondering about the change? Yes, okay. And then um, there was a sort of a third part, which was that you get your students to go out on the land and create a footprint out in the land and a gratitude to the land. And you're wondering about appropriation in that part. Okay. So I'm going to, as land acknowledgement is becoming more and more pervasive and accepted, I get this question a lot. And um, so here's the first thing. I, I don't speak for all Indigenous people, so I always feel like that caveat. I can only speak for myself and uh, what I have garnered from walking across Turtle Island. And the first thing I would say to you is to ask yourself what the purpose of the land acknowledgement is. Right? Why are we doing it to begin with? And for me, <laughs> what that purpose of a land acknowledgement is, is to right a wrong <laughs> that was done for generations that we have all been walking on Turtle Island, myself included. I, I wasn't thinking about what whose territory I was going through. And yet we think we don't need to do it, but yet we have signs. You're now entering, entering Toronto, you're entering Markham, you're entering Calgary. We have all of these signs everywhere. We have ways to know when we're entering somebody else's territory, someone else's land. And so we're trying to bring balance to our land acknowledgement because there isn't signs, there's not all those things yet. So how do we, with our words, right that wrong, bring that equity back, because this is more than just being, it's more than me just being in Kelowna. I'm not just in Kelowna. I'm in the unceded uh, traditional territories of the uh, Okanagan people, of the Silks people, who have languages and cultures. And so I am wanting to say those words to acknowledge where I actually am in. Yes, I'm in Kelowna, but more importantly, in my opinion, I'm in Silks territory. The second thing that a land and acknowledgement is trying to do, in my opinion, is to then honor those people. So it's a righting of a wrong and it's honoring. It's a honoring of the people whose territory that this is. And what an honoring does is it always reminds me of being a guest in someone's home. Like when you when someone invites you to dinner, <laughs> you don't just run in <laughs> with your shoes on and jump on their couch and go into their fridge and look at what they've got, right? You come with a gift. You walk in and say, thank you for having me. It's so nice to be here. You look to see, do I take off my shoes or, is, or the, you wait for the host to say, no, no, leave your shoes on. Don't worry about it. It's dirty in here. Like You wait to be shown what to do. You enter with humility, with gratitude right and you, you're you're acknowledging that piece and so those are those two things and so how you then do a land acknowledgement i worry that we start to get very prescriptive and i'm hearing a lot of indigenous people go don't bother if you're just going to read off something that it doesn't you don't even know what it is if you're going to sit there and just rattle off thanks for being here and i and i'm going to read this and read this and you don't know why you're doing it then it's not even worth it so you then need to find your piece in this of, okay, what is my role in righting the wrong, acknowledging where the territory lines are, and how do I honor the people that have been here since time immemorial? So how I do that is I think of myself as a guest. <laughs> what do I say when I walk into someone's home? 
right? I knock first and wait to be invited. <laughs> when I come in, I say thank you. I acknowledge what a beautiful home they have. I bring a gift and I make sure when I leave, I haven't caused havoc the whole time that I've been there. I've possibly helped with dishes before I leave. I've brought my dishes to the sink, right? So all of those pieces are what land acknowledgement is. So I don't know if that's super direct. I would just encourage you not to get caught up in words. Instead, embrace the feeling. What is it that you're wanting to say from your heart and speak from your heart? And that can never be wrong. It's always right. Um, miigwech. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, great question. Wonderful question and, and just wonderful explanation. Carly, thank you. And Sandra, we have you back. We had you muted or something, and but I think we have you. Are you there, Sandra? Yes. Can, can you hear me okay? We sure can. Wonderful. Chimigwetch, Carly, that was really wonderful to hear. And now you see why I wanted Carly to be part of this. Um, a couple of things that we say really tie into mysticism. And one of it is the land for Indigenous people is the classroom. And that the mysticism, it's very multi sensorial, so we engage all the senses of children. And Families and parents, and educators love Mr. Tim equally. So I would say it's really appropriate for grade six to grade eight, and then families and educators. And one of the things that the story is about as well is about free will, the importance of free will, and learning more about residential schools and giving children the tools to speak about residential schools and Indigenous peoples early on, because children often ask the best questions, the most succinct questions. They go right to the heart often in ways that adults don't. <laughs> so we do hope that you join us, Mr. Tim, um, from September 30th to October 18th, which is a collaboration with Red Sky and the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. And Carly, you're a wonder. I always love listening to you. And I know our paths will cross many, many times. <laughs> Jimmy, uh, this wonderful. And Sandra, we do have some questions in the, in the chat and also for myself. So Mr. Tim, for those who aren't clear of what it is, this is a live theater production that you are broadcasting virtually. Is that correct? It's a digital film. So what we did was we shot it and at the Toronto Symphony Orchestra work with indigenous music creators and a mentorship therein. And you will see a beautiful story uh, that unfolds through dance, singing, theater, and mask. Because the horse is in a is in a mask. And it's uh, it's a piece that we performed. A million children have seen it live to date. A million, because we've been touring it for seven years, Canada, United States, and China. And one prize is nominated for awards and stuff. But it's a really, I really um, encourage educators to come and watch Mr. Tim and hear the music see the horse in all of his splendor. We also have language, which uh, the Cree language is, is um, and one of, the, one of the questions that children ask every single time is Cree a real language? Always the consistent question. So we have a lot of work to do as educators to help to build, um, I'm hearing myself um, always in an echo. Uh, those really bizarre talking to you right now. <laughs> so it's a it's a hundred dollars per classroom. You can get it online either at Red Sky Performance, Toronto Symphony Orchestra, Rose Theater, and it's an amazing deal. 
So I really recommend. And at the very, very end, we will have a social roundup uh, on October 14th, where you'll meet the performers and the artists as well. There'll be a Q and A. So there's a lot more information. Um, I'll put it in the chat room. For sure. And we'll also send that all by email as well, Sandra. For, thank Amazing. you so much for that. And so, yes, there was some clarification needed. Is this free? No, in fact, it's only it's a hundred dollars for you and your entire class to be able to watch this. And I know there are school licenses is available as well, but we'll send that information out to you. And as Sandra mentioned, we're going to have them back. We're going to be live streamed the next time where we'll be able to come into your classrooms and your students will be able to watch the broadcast and we'll have a way that they can communicate with us. Your students will have a chance to ask questions to the production staff. I think we'll probably have Toronto Symphony um, guests with us as well. Sandra will be there. Um, I know I am I am thrilled to be able to, to watch Mr. Tim and I can't wait for that October 14th, which we'll get you more information on that in the follow up email as well. Um, great. Well, I think most of these questions, there was a question, this recording, which you're all going to get, um, can you share it? And the answer of course is yes. In fact, you, you can share the recording we give you. And then I know Sandra is going to put it up on the Red Sky YouTube. We'll have it up on our Cobblestone YouTube, but yes, of course, Carly, your words, we hope they go viral and people share and share. And here's a picture of Mr. Tim, can you see him? We can, yes. <laughs> That's what he looks like. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, and then Sandra, there was a clarification. Just the age range, the most appropriate age range for Mr. Tim. Uh, what were those grades again? Grade one to uh, grade six. So grade one through six, but I mean, educators, families. Educators, I feel like families, even older children enjoy it. Even younger, precocious five-year-olds will enjoy it as well because they just, they see things differently. When they're really young, they see the horse and that's all they wanna see. And when they're a little bit older, they're a little bit interested in the relationships between the the boy and the girl, the res mm -hmm. and the ran. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun and um, to create something so timely and relevant for children. And I only got the idea for this because I was watching listening to children ask questions and they just asked the most incredible questions and didn't veer off stayed focused and i thought why isn't there more created for children then around reconciliation around indigenous stories which quite frankly there's a huge hunger for indigenous stories and um indigenous ways of knowing and being that more more and more people would love to learn about. So we thought we would create Mr. Tim and it really deserves to be online and digital and for all of you to come. We'll come to you now um, uh, virtually and uh, we look forward to that. And it's available as well for live performances later. Probably wow. after, after <laughs> probably next year. Sure. Later here, it'll also be available for um, coming to your schools. Um, wow. And Fabulous. Well, wonderful. Well, I think that that's just a perfect place to end things. Um, Sandra, again, thank you so much. I look so forward to to watching Mr. Tim. Carly, just to be able to learn and listen from you in the last hour has just been fabulous. So thank you so much. And, and all of you that are here joining us, thanks for taking some time out of your really busy, busy lives and evenings. Um, but we sure appreciate you all being here and, and hope to see you again back when we bring our students for some Q&A. So thank you everyone very much.